great, thank you. Um, good evening, I want to thank everybody for attending and anybody who's listening tonight. This is our regular June uh, board meeting. We did start at 6 o'clock. Um, we had a very short closed session, and then we did some board development and announcements in between, which were recorded. And we are now back to start our open part of the meeting. Um, and the first thing I need to do is to have approval of the minutes from two meetings, our regular May meeting and an additional minutes or additional meeting we had two weeks ago. So moved. Second. All in favor of those? Any discussion? Anybody have any concerns about those minutes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Then I need approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Um, I did ask. We're all good with that? OK. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. And at this time, um, I do have some individuals who would like to speak to the board, and we appreciate um, attendance and we appreciate that um, community members come in and speak to us about their concerns. The first person I have is Mike Berry. Hi. Thank Hi. you for coming. Can you hear me through? Uh, okay, great. Um, good evening. My name is Mike Berry. I'm the executive director of the Wisconsin Association of School Business Officials. Um, uh, our organization has about 1,500 members, mostly the chief financial officers, chief operating officers, directors of transportation and facilities, and so on. Um, since 1993, one of our most uh, respected uh, members has been uh, Steve Summers, continues to be Steve Summers. Steve is uh, joining us uh, virtually. Hi, Steve. I can see you on the screen. I'm sure Steve would. I prefer it that way because he would die of embarrassment if, uh, if he was here in the room, right? So uh, last month, the WASPO Board of Directors named Steve as the 2021 winner of the uh, Wallace Zastro Award. This is essentially the Mount Rushmore of school business officials. Wow. And um, it's an award that recognizes significant career-long excellence in leadership and service to the profession to public education, and to the local community, in this case, um, Wanakee, which is a wonderful school district. Uh, when I was next door as the chief financial officer in Madison, uh, Wanakee just killed us on open enrollment. <laughs> but, but we're not here to <laughs> complain about that, are we? We're, this is the Steve's night. So uh, among Steve's many contributions to the profession, he is being recognized for the annual school finance workshop that he runs at the Wisconsin School Board's convention, where he helps board members from all around the state learn about school finance, for teaching in the grad program at UW-Whitewater, helping aspiring school business officials prepare for the profession, and for service to his professional peer group here in Dane County, where Steve is really well known and respected. So Steve is described by his colleagues as smart, thoughtful, student-centered, a quiet leader, and a steady hand on the wheel. We're lucky to have him here in Wanakee, and I uh, appreciate this opportunity to present this award virtually uh, to Steve. Uh, Randy, can I leave this with you? You can, absolutely. Thank you. I'll let you down tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Steve. All right. Um, on to other um, public comments. And just so you know, to kind of manage and keep our meeting time kind of intact, we do limit public comments to three minutes, and Judy is going to be my timekeeper tonight. So uh, the first person who would like to speak to us is Jason Grasa. Grosha? Grosha. Grosha. Sorry. Grosha. Grosh. Oh, is that an H? Yeah. <laughs> Looked like an A at the end. Sorry. Apologies for my handwriting there. First of all, thank you for your time that you've committed as your role as board members. Uh, I'm speaking from the perspective of a father of four daughters. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Including my oldest, who was enrolled as a first grader at Flip Prairie Elementary School this past school year. 
once my daughter was finally allowed in mid-April to go to school for in-person schooling four days out of the week, she still had to endure two additional weeks of worthless virtual schooling due to two week-long quarantines that were imposed on her entire class. Every time we received a call that the class was going to be quarantined, my daughter's heart was broken. I have witnessed the significant tears and disappointment my daughter has had to endure with virtual learning and screen time. I'm optimistic that you will finally put children first and eliminate the unnecessary quarantines of entire classrooms immediately, including for summer school. In-person learning, especially for children my daughter's age, is strongly advocated for, even during this pandemic, by the American Academy of Pediatrics, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and also by the New England Journal of Medicine. The harm done to all kids related to the excessive screen time, lack of adequate socialization, and the constant chaos pivoting from in-person learning the virtual and back for the past 15 months is already immeasurable. Any additional classroom quarantines that get imposed in the future will unnecessarily pile on to the significant damage that has already been done. There is ample data available now from schools that have been in person since the beginning of the pandemic that confirm that schools simply are not a significant driver of transmission and transmission is especially low among younger children. When you consider that there's an abundant supply of vaccines available for everyone else, there is no good reason to continue the quarantine of entire classrooms. Parents are always free to hold their kids at home if they want, but that should be the parents' decision, not the government's. I speak for many frustrated and angry parents when I say it's finally time to start doing what's right for the kids and end the quarantining of entire classrooms immediately. These kids cannot get back to full-time in-person schooling soon enough. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate your comments. Um, next, Greg Gens. Welcome. Thank you. Can you give me a 30-second warning when I get close? Sure. <laughs> Just holler out 30, thanks. All right, first of all, I want to thank everyone, uh, Superintendent Gutenberg, for your uh, ad hoc medical committee recommendations on discontinuing <coughs> some of the COVID-19 policies that are happening. I wanted to speak to the doctor that recommended, one out of three, that recommended um, continuing masking for K through six. He said if, they can, if we can keep one kid from getting potentially ill, well, creating policies that mandate masks for unvaccinated kids that coerce parents into vaccinating them, kids can get Ill, Ill from vaccinations too. That is not a zero risk game. Um, I, June 2nd, I went to the state capitol and I gave testimony after sitting through six hours of testimony about three, uh, five bills that are going through the state capitol to prohibit vaccine passports, basically discrimination upon vaccine status. Those uh, prohibitions have been already passed in 23 states. Many people t spoke to the injury of vaccines. I'm not an anti-vaxxer, I'm vaccinated myself. However, um, those five bills prohibiting vaccine discrimination and policies in schools, U uh, UW system, private business, uh, any kind of organizations, um, those would uh, prohibit any kind of policy that's discrimin discriminatory on vaccine status, including mask wearing. So I wanna say that Right now, we just got a ruling from the Wisconsin Supreme Court that Dane County's order to close schools was unconstitutional and not per statute. I would also pose that coercive policies of wearing masks because you're not vaccinated would also be unconstitutional through the aspect of being a fundamental right violation because it's a coercive policy of kids separating from vaccinated, not vaccinated, non-vaccinated kids having to wear masks, and uh, that would be a fundamental right aspect that would be judged under strict scrutiny, which requires you guys to prove why that violation of individual rights would be allowed. Again, it's creating a discriminatory mask wearing policy if you're not vaccinated. I think you need to be aware that that is the unintended consequences of this. And go ahead and go on uh, Wisconsin 
I.org to look at that six hours of testimony from June 2nd. It's under the Constitution Committee. Uh, also, um, <coughs> I also want to talk about, we got 30, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Um, there is something, these vaccines are still listed as experimental and under emergency use. They are not FDA approved. So talking about getting our kids that are 5 to 12 and vaccinations are available, getting them vaccinated and coming to herd immunity, which is complained at the board constantly with vaccination status and herd immunity. Herd immunity includes natural immunity of people that have COVID. And that would actually be violating coercive vaccination of experimental drugs would be violating Nuremberg Code that uh, stops human right violations from coerced experimentation participation like these vaccines. Again, not an anti-vaxxer. I just want you to be aware of these situations and possible unintended consequences those actions could have. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Any other comments? Ready, Judy? Yes. Um, Bob Proudfit. Welcome. Hi. Uh, my name is Bob Proudfit. I have two boys. Uh, we're going to be a freshman next year, and then we're going to be a junior. Uh, I'm strongly against any mandatory mask requirement or any policy requiring uh, mandatory vaccination of, which is still an experimental vaccine. It's an approved in emergency powers, but it's still an experimental vaccine. Um, I love the school district. I love the opportunity to provide to the kids. I love my kids being here. But my wife and I have talked about this, and um, I want them to graduate from Wanakee, but if this policy continues or these policies continues, we're seriously considering pulling them out with the funding and going elsewhere for school. Um, one last thing, I guess, and based on kind of what Greg said too, you know, the Florida Court of Appeals just ruled two to one that any mask mandate in the state of Florida is unconstitutional under Florida law. And that kind of flies, goes along with what Greg was saying. It should be a choice. If kids want to wear a choice, or families do, or get vaccinated, it should be a choice. But I just want to voice my um, opposition <coughs> to any mandatory forced vaccination or masking of our kids anymore. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Proudfit, welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Jen Proudfit, and we've been a resident of Wanakee for 12 years. So as Bob said, we have a junior and an eighth grader. And you know, not only have I seen just their moods decline, you know, and you've heard these stories a number of times, you know, I find the mask covering the face and the social expressions. I mean, I value my children's academic success in school, but I also want them to learn socially and about human interactions and behaviors. When I can't hear half the time, I go to a grocery store, I can't hear. It's difficult, sometimes I notice myself just blowing off half of what somebody has said to me because I figure it's probably not important anyway. And I know my child who struggles with focusing and attention needs to see a facial expression. It's detrimental to me that he has a choice to wear a mask next year, and I just would like for that to be heard, so thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Ariel Barak, welcome. Hi everybody, um, good evening school board members. Uh, my name is Ariel Barak. I would like to thank you all for your service to the Wanaki School District in general, but uh, especially during these uncertain times. Uh, also, same for teachers. No one obviously signed up to teach uh, in these uh, circumstances. Uh, I'm here as the father of four children, the youngest of which is 12 days old. My wife is at home right now juggling dinner time and uh, probably been up by bedtime, I hope, <laughs> bedtime activities so that I can be here. She's doing so because of how important we believe it is for the board to continue the mask requirement for summer school. The CDC guidance states that children over two years of age should wear a mask in public settings. And uh, you know, to me, it doesn't seem to get much more of a public setting than a public school. We are in a much better place than we were even just a few months ago but the battle against COVID has not yet been won. Vaccinations, masks, and social distancing are without a doubt our best weapons. Per public health of Madison and Dane County, 39% of the population in Dane County is not fully vaccinated. That's slightly less than 215,000 people in Dane County. As you all know, all children age 11 and under are not yet eligible for the COVID vaccines. This means that all of the families in our community with children Children age, 11, children age 11 and under do not have a fully vaccinated household. While, while uh, positive COVID test rates right now are low, 
I'm very concerned about the Delta variant uh, first uh, detected in India, now um, taking over the UK, uh, which is more transmissible. All of our children are amazing, resilient, and highly adaptable. They have dealt with mask requirements, not just in schools, but in most settings. I urge you to continue to give our community time to increase our vaccination rates, uh, approach herd immunity, and keep our community and children safe by enforcing mask requirements inside Wanaki School District buildings this summer. We're, we're close, so right now there's 60% so there's vaccinated that have gotten at least one dose. There's 67% um, that have, I'm sorry, there's a 7% difference between those that have gotten the first shot and those that are fully vaccinated. So that's only a two week window. So think about it, if we can wait another month or two, that's a, a chance to really get uh, it up into the 80s, maybe higher. So uh, I'm guessing I'm gonna be the only one that speaks uh, in, uh, in favor of masks. So thanks for hearing me. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, John Nettie. Hi hey there, I'm John Nitty. I have two children in the Wanaki School District. One is uh, in third grade, the other one's in fifth. He's autistic, um, so uh, he has obviously a lot of different educational needs that other kids don't have, including um, social uh, inability to, or, or a reduced ability to learn socially. Mass have been destructive for him uh, all along, and I think this last year has been horribly destructive for him uh, and other kids. And, uh, because masks, what they do is they prevent facial expressions from being seen. They prevent um, that sort of personal connection that kids have with other kids and, and other adults. Um, and I, I guess um, that is concerning to me, obviously, because I love my children more than anything in the world, certainly more uh, than my own life. And I have to say that what disturbs me is we have a room here of adults who are probably all vaccinated and we're all wearing masks. Why? Is that because we've decided that, I know it's school property, I get you have that policy. That's not lost on me. But we're sitting here wearing masks, we're all vaccinated. For what purpose? Because government, but there is no government order that says we must other than a school edict. But we're wearing masks because why? So we can violate our own civil liberties? Because that's what this is. This is about, no longer about health. This is about dictates to compel other people who choose not to wear masks because they don't believe it's necessary under these circumstances. Um, the people like this gentleman that just spoke, he has every right to advocate the way he does. But the problem with, and the fallacy in his argument is, he can choose to have his kids come to school and wear masks. We don't have to. His kids are safe then. If he's afraid, he should have them wear masks. But I don't want to choose that for my kids. Because first of all, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that masks don't really uh, reduce the spread of COVID anyway. We also have known all along, and it continues to be true, that children simply aren't affected by COVID and don't spread it uh, nearly as much as uh, adults. And it's certainly a much less uh, percentage than say flu or strep throat or other things uh, that continue to be passed around in the schools. There was a strep outbreak while we're wearing masks. What does that tell you? It tells you that masks are not foolproof. They do not work like we think they work. It's feel good stuff that makes us feel comfortable it may have some benefit in certain circumstances, but now we have a bunch of adults that are now, 30 seconds? No, you're done. Okay, <laughs> let me just, you probably want me to be done. Let me, let me just say uh, that ultimately, this is a civil liberty issue. And if you let government encroach on our uh, rights, slowly but surely, we'll lose them. Thank you, thank you, John. Um, those are the only sheets I got unless there's somebody got this. Um, I also want to recognize that we had a number of people write to the board members, and I just wanted to acknowledge that in those cases, we all receive them. We all take that responsibility to read prior to our meeting, but they are no longer being read at meetings. 
So I appreciate all those comments, and that kind of concludes our public comment section. Moving on to board reports. Um, I do see we have a few teachers come. Did you guys come to report or just to comment on that section later in the HR part? Great, thank you. Don't want to miss you if you wanted to say something. Thank you. Um, if there's any uh, board members that attended anything recently that you would like to share, you may do that at this point. But yeah, we uh, recently had uh, <coughs> the uh, chair of uh, mechanical engineering at UW Madison and some of his team members to uh, the Innovation Center. And, you know, basically what we're looking at is how can we partner with uh, UW on some of the uh, things that we're doing. And there's further discussions that uh, are going on. Uh, we actually had their uh, senior design professor uh, at, uh, at uh, our innovation center, and there could be some interactions with some of the things that our seniors are doing and and they're doing. So it was a good meeting, and uh, we appreciate uh, the people uh, that came from uh, UW Madison and Rebecca for organizing it because it uh, schedules change quite a bit. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jack, for referring to um, Moving on to committee reports, um, starting with our DEI ad hoc committee. David, are you? Sure. Um, so the ad hoc committee met again this month. Um, we furthered, got through another section of the audit on diversity. Uh, we also set up a schedule for two meetings for this summer. The first one will be a three-hour meeting to complete the audit. Hopefully that will be then completed as part of the probably the report the board will get by the end of summer. And the second meeting will be about setting agenda and looking at organizing what the committee would be doing for the following year. Uh, it was brought up about the membership of the committee being volunteer. Several people have you know, going on to other commitments. A couple students graduated. So we will be, I'm sure Joan and I will be working on the process of getting the committee back up to strength as we start another school year. Um, David, do you have the dates of those summer meetings? Um, they were in the minutes. No, they don't have them scheduled yet. Okay. They're not scheduled yet. Yeah, I think he just guessed the rough months I think he put in. No, I, I didn't even put anything. I think, think we're looking at the first one was going to be in July, roughly, and then the second one was going to be in August. And hopefully the second one, the plan was to probably have it in person in a retreat style. Okay. I may have to buy pizza. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next committee to report is our HR committee. I know there's a number <coughs> of things. I'll, I'll let Brian, as he's walking up, I'll introduce the employee handbooks and he can then talk about the compensation model. Um, in your packet tonight you'll see the second reading of our employee guidelines. This is um, customary that we bring those for two meetings in a row. We reviewed them last month um, and any feedback or questions were addressed and so tonight they're in front of you for adoption so that we can have them in place for the beginning of the fiscal year. So we'd be looking for your consideration and action on the employee guidelines tonight. So. How about if we do a motion on that first and then we'll hear about the rest? I move to accept the uh, revisions in the employee handbooks. Second. Um, any concerns about, I think we have three employee handbooks now. They've been kind of condensed down. Anybody have any concerns? All in favor of adopting those for next year, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. And the next item is the teacher compensation model. So I know, Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, I also brought uh, Todd and, and Gina from the committee uh, and Amy as well. Um, the, the committee is uh, convened by the board. We, we began our, our, our kind of our journey that got us to this moment uh, two years ago. And so um, in November, I believe, of 2019 was when we first started uh, the review of our compensation system at that point. Uh, between then and now, uh, the committee has met 16 times. and. Uh, 
reviewed external information, internal information, um, reviewed, uh, got received feedback from the HR committee and the school board, um, and, and from the teaching uh, group as a whole, and, and synthesized together what we have put in front of you in terms of uh, handbook language. Um, some costing information and some examples uh, of how it would work for hypothetical educators. Uh, I guess we're prepared to answer any questions that you might have um, through the materials that, that uh, we shared with you. I guess one of the things you're uh, talking about is the uh, point system, right? Uh, in, in this. And you know, I guess uh, it, it seems like you uh, you just get uh, $400 if you come back to re-sign your contract and come back to the next year. Uh, and I guess I was under the impression that the point system was for professional development and to encourage uh, people to do uh, professional development. And, you know, when you look at it, uh, a good share of your uh, points, uh, or, or a good share of the uh, funding received from points, is uh, basically just re-signing the contract. Well, I think those are, Jack, I was myself on the HR committee, but I think you're, are you talking about $400? Yeah. Just to, okay, not the points. It's not 400 points, it's $400. What does that connect automatically as they move to the next year? And, and Brian can explain that a little yeah. bit. More. In addition to the CPI, you're just saying that's tacked on to. It's a, a CPI kind of. plus 400. Right, that's right. Yeah. Yep. And, and so, yes, Jack, that is something that, that was built into the system. Um, we, we did that for a, a few reasons. Uh, I would say one is that. I guess maybe an acknowledgement first that, that not every teacher is eligible to receive that $400. They, they need, uh, the, any teacher that would be on a, a plan of improvement, so in other words their performance was uh, and remained on a plan of improvement, would not get, get the opportunity to have that automatic raise. But, but the other part is that um, a year of experience in education has, has unquestionable value. You know, the, the opportunity to, to learn from colleagues, to, to uh, go through the professional development in, in which the district uh, pursues in any given year, um, and to just reflect professionally uh, is something that we believe makes an educator a better educator from one year to the next. And so um, there weren't points given for that, but, but there is in the system acknowledgement that that, that does have value. So how does this differ from the, uh, the old step and ladder system that, uh, that was in place prior to F10? So when you say step and ladder, do you refer to our, our first, uh, the Wanakee system or one that we probably more traditionally see in other school systems? More traditionally see in other school systems. Um, that, that one that would have, uh, again, You'd have vertical, you'd, you'd move vertically on that for experience, and, and you move horizontally in those systems by taking advanced, uh, by taking advanced coursework credits and, and earning advanced degrees. Um, the point system uh, does recognize that some individuals pursue professional development within traditional means, college courses, uh, advanced degrees, but it also recognizes that professional development can happen in other ways, uh, it can happen through uh, work with colleagues, uh, book studies, for example. It can happen by uh, participating in uh, webinars, uh, you know, a, a variety of different means. And the point system permits uh, ways to, to have teachers uh, learn and add to their skills outside of having to take and pay for coursework. Mark, you want to make Yeah, um, I actually have the privilege of working on this the system that you are modifying. And it, I think to help explain the 400 points for experience, all the research we did showed that there is 
a vast amount of benefit to your first five, te five years as a teacher. After that, it, the benefits of experience has a less impact, and so that's where we created a system where from zero to five years, you got 400 points for your experience, and thereafter, you, had, you got 200 points, which if you wanted to keep up with the financial part, it would encourage you to do more professional development. And noting what uh, the new system is, uh, it actually comes short of $200, uh, excuse me, um, $400 for that experienced teacher. Uh, the points were three dollars uh, a point, and so rather than getting $600 when they can claim their points, they're only going to get $400. Uh, so it's sort of a blend to kind of, kind of bridge, it's what it looked like to me, and in combination with the CPI it provides. Uh, I thought it was a creative way to go. Any other questions? The goal is to put this in the handbook so that teachers are aware for this coming year what they're working on for their salary advancement next year. So we are looking to move this into the handbook and um, I know you haven't seen it before and it might feel rushed, but we would like to put it in the handbook for the following. So when you look at this, uh, we've always talked uh, 1,500 points, we've never really paid up to get 1,500. Uh, are we looking at a maximum of 750 points now? Or Maximum of seven hundred and fifty dollars. Is that you got the four hundred plus the seven fifty? So you're at part. Yeah, uh, a typical year would would allow someone to to get the four hundred dollar experience raise, uh, and then if they had achieved or have uh, two hundred fifty professional development points or twenty five hours of professional development, they would be able to to use those points to advance. A total of eleven $1 hundred and fifty dollars, um, and in addition, what, what we added into the system was a way to start to address the the one point three million dollars worth of points that are currently in the bank uh, to allow individuals on on five year intervals, uh, five years from hire, that they can if they have a points bank available to them, they can use another two hundred and fifty points or seven hundred fifty dollars on five year intervals. Uh, so in, in a way, in another way to, to encourage staff to stay with us uh, as an opportunity to, is instead of delaying that compensation until the retirement, uh, that they can, they can earn those dollars while active and, and in the retirement system um, and, and hope to have it benefit them and, and ultimately uh, have it be less of a liability for us hanging out over our heads uh, years in the future. So have you costed this out or made estimates? What What is this plan going to cost us? It did. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, the, comp the third item down, the composition costing um, compared to current, um, there's a, a couple things that I'll, I'll point out to you on that. And I use, what we used on that was we used the, uh, the 1920, uh, that'd be the column on the left. And as I said that out loud, I remembered that I mentioned that I wanted to put 1920, love that column again, and didn't. Um, so the column on the left is 1920 school year, the column on the right in the proposed system is the 2021 school year. And so what, what uh, yep, thank you. So what we did is we used the current levels of staffing that we have, uh, again, in those, two, in those two years. So we know what we spent, and that's in the box on the upper right. Uh, what was spent, uh, box in the upper right and then the second box down, tells us what we actually spent in those two years for compensation. If we look under the, uh, the column on the left where it says summary, um, you know, the proposed system, uh, I don't know, actually I, let me pull my, my sheet up here so I, then I can step forward and get right in the middle of the ring and really feel the heat. Um, We'd love you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Um, and so what, what that says again is proposed system in 1920, for example. You mean what, 2020? Uh, no, no 19, uh, 1920. So in the, uh, actually I'll just step up here. The year 19. 
The year 2019, 2020. Got it. <laughs> so uh, again, I'm focused on this column right here. This is the 2019-2020 uh, uh, school year. Staff, our, our numbers here are based off the staff we held that year. Here is the what we spent, already spent. Um, if we were using the new system parameters, uh, the total expense would be uh, $866,690. Uh, that compares to what we currently did. We spent $747,649.53, uh, but then we deferred $176,700. Um, and so the difference between what the proposed system would cost versus the current system in uh, actual expenses, deferred uh, expenses that we have to pay out in the future, would the current, the proposed system actually would, would save us uh, over the life of that $57,000, uh, 57659 dollars. And, and then, if, again, uh, we had a similar comparison uh, here on the 2020-2021 school year. So uh, the uh, additional savings is larger we, because we have more teaching staff this year. So that, that's why that number increases. Um, and then it, how it does that is kind of down here. It addresses the, it addresses the point. Uh, sorry, Steve. It addresses the, it addresses the point bank um, by decreasing it, uh, not adding to that liability. And in essence, uh, we, we are paying uh, more money now to teachers with a smaller deferred expense out into the future. Um, so it, that's where the savings come from. Mark, another comment? Yeah, it, to me it just seems a win-win for both the uh, WTA and for the district. I mean, in fairness, all that deferred pay, I would submit there are only contractors that don't get their full pay for the job done. You know, we can't hire a plumber and delay their, their you know, uh, a third of their pay for 20, 25 years, but we've been doing that to our staff for, for a very long time because the district just doesn't have enough money to pay the full 1,500 points. And then it becomes a liability down the road. So I think that saves us in the liability. I, I think it rewards the staff in a way that they can access their points sooner. Uh, and even the fact that they get it when they retire that's something normally in other districts they would have gotten that every year because that was the new salary that they had. And so they deferred some teachers 10 years of compensation uh, and that they don't get in retirement. They get, the, they get the base number that we transferred off to the future. So I think for them it's good looking at the numbers in terms of savings. Uh, I just want to commend the committee for coming up with a plan that looks Pretty impressive to me. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. I mean, it it, uh, the, it was a lot, and, and it was a it was really a joint effort. Which uh, got to commend the committee. Uh, our our discussions were <clears throat> were spirited and fruitful, <laughs> uh, and so I think I feel good about what we put out as, as something that's good for both the district and the and the teachers. And the committee was formed by. Uh, this was, the well, teachers the, the, were involved the, the, in this, is what I'm trying to yeah, publicly yeah, like, say. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it wasn't just the administration. Or no, the it was uh, it, the, the committee was uh, essentially a 50 50 split of uh, teachers, or actually a little bit more teachers than it was admitted. Yeah. It also articulates kind of that, that challenge we've had with our previous system with the experience piece and then also kind of the negotiations of CPI. And so, but generally, what you're looking at in this piece is trying to guarantee these points pieces up front and then also needing to then negotiate CPI um, given that that's the fluctuating scale every year for the state. That, that's, that was part of the overwhelming feedback that we received uh, that led to the, 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 the board received that led to the formation of this committee um, over several, the last several years. Uh, it was that staff wanted the predictability of, of a system that so that they could forecast if they did their part of the professional development and gave their experience uh, what it could look like in, in the next year for them 
uh, and, and that's one of the fundamental parts of this system is, is that it, it is predictable. Um, it, it is, we, we believe, more clear how it operates. Um, and, and it, again, kind of repeating myself, it, it benefits them uh, because it provides more money and less deferred. It benefits us because it saves our, our long-term liability. I think they have another question. Uh, I gotta say, I, looking through the numbers and stuff, it provides, I think budgetarily, it provides us with a more level feel that we're not wondering, you know, how to vote, vote points in that cause huge shifts in the budget, and that I like. The one thing is, this is something I've brought up, I don't know how many years, we have a lot of other classifications that have no ability to get raises from professional development. And I know there was a, an attempt for a while to start creating that, and we've dropped off it, and it's been a tough year, but we need to get back to that. And I'm, I'm a little disappointed that we go through all this work to create a system for teachers with no consideration for how anyone else would fit into such a system. And I still remember from one listening session that we have non-teachers teaching the professional development that teachers use to get pay increases. Yet the person teaching the class gets nothing. And that just makes no sense to me. At some point, we've got to get everybody on a similar system so it's fair to everyone and we can get the same stability we're looking for here in the rest of our system. And I, I you know, certainly have, have heard that feedback too. And part of what I would respond to that is that uh, our hourly staff, uh, they have their, they, they receive their raises by tenure or by a length of service and um, solely length of service. And then every year we take that, that system and we raise that by an established or a percentage that the board establishes. And, uh, this one is, is different in the respect that it is partially based on experience, but partially based on what the, the development individuals go out and get in, the, in that year. The, you know, and which, is, which is different than hourly. Hourly folks get advanced by returning. But, so, but you can do professional development absolutely. for hourly Profession people and let them change the hourly number in the same way you change the salary number for a teacher. Absolutely, their professional development for every employee is, is a benefit to them and to their employer, on question. But don't you have a uh, salary range for the hourly? We, we do. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, you know, as you do the uh, professional development, there, there's an opportunity to uh, give that person a little bit more money in that salary range? Uh, it, it, no, at, at this time, that is not possible. It, it's, it's advancement by length of service. Are there what, what we had shared different? previously was that what we wanted to do was get the set. We had we had that bunching up in, at the median, right. and that's what we corrected this year was to spread that out over the whole length of the salary schedule. And once that was the first step, and then the, the next concept was to see are there other ways to incentivize kind of growth um, once we have that piece in place. So if there is a discussion point, that would be the place where it would, have, where it would occur. But we had to first get to getting the salary schedule kind of back to its, its, its full length of experience. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, could we have a motion? Did you have a question, Ted? I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say you kind of, the only way is really longevity is they're different. I'm, I can't think of what all the different things are, but are there within some of those disciplines different levels of advancement, or like they're the lead, whatever, or they're the senior, whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah totally there, that. there is. Yes. Which, to that point, if you're doing some kind of development, maybe that takes you or allows you to get to that level, and that's a, that's a way to address it. That's all I was kind of thinking. Okay, um, so if you're comfortable, I would entertain a motion to move this into the handbook so our teachers next year begin working with this system as they look at their advances in the following school. So moved. Second. Good. So Brian and Judy, um, any other discussion or questions? All in favor of this new system, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Brian.
Um, next we have the Medical Advisory Ad Hoc Committee, and they had one meeting last week. And yeah, I'll make a couple of things here. First of all, I just want to, we did include in front of the, for the board members the, the new data Kurt pulled today. It's very similar to what we saw at Medical Ad Hoc last week or seven days. If you look at our Wanakee um, numbers, this isn't just Wanakee School District as far as students, this is Wanakee Community as far as the geographic area of Wanakee Schools from the north shore of the lake all the way up to our, our more rural areas to the north. Uh, when we take a look at that on, day, on table number 13, you can just see our seven-day positive cases is 0.43. 14-day average is the same. Our burden rate is three. And the burden rate is figured as your 14-day rate per 100,000. So those are numbers that we haven't seen in, in a long, long, long time. They're extremely low as far as what we're seeing as far as disease impacts community-wide. Generally, what you're seeing on a daily basis is about one positive case every three days. So that's, that's kind of what it's averaging out to. Anything to add to that no, data perspective? No. no. Yeah. But just kind of, we brought that forward tonight, really from the perspective of just to give you an idea, we're continuing to see the similar type of low um, incident rates that we've seen over the last um, number of weeks. Um, but I want to take a, a chance to talk about, and I'm going to ask Rebecca if you can pull up um, yeah, what I titled medical ad hoc. It's a little bit, I'm actually going to start off with just kind of a little bit of a preamble of, of what we did at the Medical Advisory Committee, then I'm going to come back to this sheet. Um, the first thing we did was obviously we look at our data. Our data is very similar to what we just presented. The other piece is that really the, the crux of what we are trying to get a sense of is, is how do we kind of move forward then with um, mitigation efforts. And I think some of the people talked about things tonight that we have a shared interest in. Um, I'm going to grab this here, Rebecca. I'm going to start at the bottom. Um, we've been putting together our data dashboard every trip and putting it together with Andy Blackburn um, every, every week. So I think going up on our, on our website. Um, it's been very helpful to us as to kind of track over time. It was really most helpful when we had all of our students back in, in, in school and were able to track really what was happening school by school and counting our incidents. As we come into the summer, our recommendation is that we, we're, there's still data pieces that we're going to be tracking, but I don't think it's as meaningful community-wise to be able to see some of those things um, just from the respect that you don't have everybody in school. Summer school is a is an elective activity of different kids coming and going throughout the summer. So there's definitely pieces that we'll track to make sure that we kind of have an idea of what's happening, but it's not really a dashboard that really has as much meaning as I think as the ones that we've been able to put up here in the school year. Um, another piece that I think was articulated in the public comments, which I mean, our, our desire is to get out of the business of contact tracing and quarantines. I mean, that is a very challenging part of, of our work this past year. It's been a reality of having to work through a pandemic, which was something that we've, we've learned um, over time. Our medical advisory group from the onset really shared with us that the things that we needed to look at with regards to our mitigation efforts were um, impact in the schools, how many kids were being impacted, impact in the community, and then being able to kind of trace in your ability to stay ahead of things. So when you take a look at kind of those precepts that we worked throughout the entire pandemic with, um, we kind of layer those pieces in here as well. The last number of weeks that school was in session, we had very low incident rates. Our contact tracers did, were not very active as far as the work that they had to do. Um, what Kurt and I learned about later this afternoon, and when I wrote this, we were kind of stating that public health was putting forth that they were gonna take over all of the contact tracing for schools Mainly that's things that we learned through some of our public health calls that we're part of every week. Kurt and I reached out on Friday with a few clarifying questions to make sure that we understood exactly what that was gonna look like in preparation for tonight. Um, we finally caught up and got some of the answers later this afternoon, about 3.30 this afternoon. Um, we're not gonna be able to completely back out of it as a district. I mean, because part of what occurs is I think that the Dane County will definitely still have a role in what they're with their contact tracers and working with schools. But if there is a positive incident within a classroom, they don't have any access to know who that child is near. 
So they're going to be requesting some of that information from us. So we have had a number of questions as far as then what does that look like? Because the, the person who shared tonight that we want to get requesting us moving away from quarantining entire classrooms, that's absolutely where we're trying to determine a process that doesn't allow, that doesn't require us to do that. And wanting to be able to um, quarantine as few kids as possible. What Kurt and I learned this afternoon was that there are some pieces that we have to work very much in in concert with um, public health with, and there are some things that um, we have some ability to kind of determine what our process is going to look like locally. Um, I wish I had absolute clarity of that to be able to articulate to you and just write down. I think that's a peer piece that I hope the board can can give Kurt and I some latitude to continue to work on over the between now and as we get moving into summer school. Our objective is to make the piece that is um, the most beneficial to us as a district that's going to put us in a position where we don't have to quarantine as many kids and certainly don't want to be quarantining classrooms. Anything to add to that conversation, Kurt? I mean, no. It's just more complicated than there's a lot of there's some questions that we have, but we have some ideas as far as how we can move ahead with it. Some of it really falls into how do you determine kind of who's a close contact and then how do you determine how that then translates into how long somebody would have to be out. Um, we had some conversations with public health on that as far as if they contact us wanting information, kind of what our process is for determining who those close contacts are. So we're working through a few items to make sure that we're tight on our process, but our goal would be to minimize that down as much as possible. Health check forms is something that we've had in place throughout uh, the, the pandemic as well. It's also a place that we would like to move away from. The whole purpose of those health check forms was to make sure that everyone was aware of what the um, uh, symptoms were for COVID and making sure that if any child or staff member had any of those symptoms that they refrained from coming to school. I mean, things as simple as a stuffy nose were turning into COVID during some of our pieces where, where we were most active in the district. So that was really one of our key uh, mitigation and, and educational um, pieces. We feel that right now we can move away from this. That was supported by the medical advisory group and continuing to communicate with parents that if they have any of these symptoms that they should hold their child home to make sure that it's not developing into something else. We start to move into the top areas. This is the area where we need probably to have the most discussion tonight. Um, what we shared with, at the Medical Ad Hoc Committee, um, we, uh, Dr. Potoff was, was able to be there in person. Dr. Ranham and Dr. Anderson um, were not able to attend in person, but I had the ability and opportunity to talk with them prior to, and they gave me permission to really summarize um, their comments. So I'm going to start off with, um, first of all, Dr. Potoff at the, at the medical ed, um, committee shared really that he felt very strongly, as was already articulated tonight, that um, K-6 students should main, continue to be masked through summer school. And his perspective on that was that that's your group that is, that does not have eligibility for the vaccine. So he felt from a vulnerability standpoint that was kind of an area that, that he felt that we should continue with. Um, he also, I think, felt comfortable with outside um, having leaving that more open and optional. And as far as 712, very much having that um, optional as well. Dr. Random, I spoke to him prior to the meeting. What he shared with me was, and he stayed very consistent with what his concerns were from the very beginning of the pandemic, which was he was most concerned about the elderly, grandparents, and then parents receive um, being vulnerable to COVID. Um, the percent of vaccinated in, within our, our, our county is, I think we're at two thirds of our, of our community a, a, as a county. And then I think in the, the elderly population, it's like 96%, it's very high. So his, his concern with regards to uh, what it's, the impact on the most vulnerable, otherwise our elderly population, he felt was, was addressed. He also shared that Generally, COVID has had a lesser impact on young people, and given that our, our COVID numbers are low, as we articulated in our data, he felt that there was low risk and that there was, if, if the district chose to, that there would be, um, 
he could support um, cover, face coverings being optional and being left up to parents um, on a K-12 basis. Um, I also spoke with Dr. Anderson. I shared really what Dr. Random's perspective was. Um, Dr. Anderson said that he um, could agree with that, that perspective, particularly since COVID numbers are low, low risk of a surge, um, increased number of people who are vaccinated, felt extremely comfortable with our 712 um, students uh, as far as them having a mask optional um, approach. Um, he said he could also get on board with the K-6 being a mask optional approach. He feels the risk of transmission is relatively low. I mean, his, uh, his one concern is just with kids with underlying issues like asthma, et cetera. And I think we've heard from some folks around that issue from our public comments as well. Um, and the vaccine piece, as far as that's all, often a question that comes forward, and it's been part of our medical advisory committee discussions, feeling like the first availability of that um, could be in September or October. I think other iterations that we've heard is it could come this summer. So I think those are pieces that, that our, our doctors on our committee have really been focusing on. Um, this is probably the first time, I think, as Dr. Pradov shared, that they have a little difference of opinion as far as, as, far as the masking piece. Um, when I think about kind of just summarizing where the committee was and feedback I've had through conversations with <coughs> other members of the board, um, I think the outdoors piece, I, I feel like there was some um, consistency amongst that that could be an optional piece. That's definitely been a, a piece that we've in, in, uh, embraced as far as our activities this spring, and I don't think that that's had any ill effects on them. Um, as far as staff, as far as you know, we've had an, a, a high percentage of our staff are vaccinated, um, that's a piece I think we want to revisit before we leave this topic tonight, um, particularly after we decide kind of where we we're at with K6 and 712. Um, I broke those two out for purposes of this document just because I felt that there were differences of, of, of opinion and also some different categories. Our current, our students who are going to be in seventh grade through 12th grade next year um, have had eligibility for the vaccine for a, number, for a few months now. So those who have been wanting to get it have been eligible to get it. So I broke that piece out separately. I think that's also why generally our, our doctors on our panel were also um, supportive of that being a mask optional um, group. The differences of opinion really fell with the K-6 areas, and I think as you've heard from some of the public comments tonight, really from the perspective of a K-6 um, individual, is that is a group that's generally not vaccinated at this point, so that they have a, have a higher vulnerability for, for COVID to be spreading. I think the issue that comes up is with the, the disease rate in the community being extremely low, how high is that risk? Um, the other piece then is, should that be an optional piece um, for parents to make that decision? Um, the piece that Kurt and I've talked about with regards to do either of those really impact us from a contact tracing piece, that's a piece that we're working through to determine really how that would, would play forward. Um, there are some different nuances within some of the uh, documents that we have received from uh, public health that we can utilize to, from a local perspective, be able to contact trace to try to minimize the number of kids we have in quarantine. It's truly not something we want to do, and it's absolutely something we look very forward to when we don't have to do that any further. But I think generally, Joan, where we're sitting here tonight is, I, I guess I would break this up into a few different areas. I think generally we're looking at operationally, um, the dashboard, the contact tracing, leave, if you can give us some latitude to work that out administratively as some of those nuances are still being worked out. Um, our goal is to make sure we minimize that as much as possible and move away from the daily health check form. Um, and I would say also the outdoor face coverings being optional. I think that's something that we've seen and has been supported generally from most of the groups and people we've talked to. I think the piece that there's probably needs to be some dialogue around the table is kind of your feelings around the K6 and 712 and treating those similarly or differently. So we have policies in place throughout COVID. Really what we're talking about tonight is trying, is really putting in place um, the, the direction we're going to follow um, into summer school. And then at a point once we're complete with summer school, which runs till the end of July, um, we will then have another medical ad hoc committee 
before our August board meeting, of which we'll then um, put forward what our plans are for fall. Some of the decisions, obviously, that we make tonight um, have some precursors as far as what fall could look like, particularly if you're looking at things like um, where we may have mass option so, so and those types of things. Me, uh, are you looking for a motion to uh, uh, do outdoor face coverings or eliminate outdoor face coverings, eliminate uh, daily health form? I'm looking for a motion that eventually here, Jack, that's going to address all those, I guess. So let me you make that motion? If you let me finish for one second, because I think some of the things we make decisions on tonight also then will inform us as far as our decision for fall. That's kind of my last comment. I think I would break it up, Jack, into a couple different motions. The first one being kind of these mitigation efforts at the bottom. Um, and if you want to throw in the outdoor face coverings as part of that, I think that makes sense. I'd rather have a discussion before we put any motion on. Sure. I don't want the term outside masking optional. It doesn't need to be addressed at all. They're outside. Right. They can choose to do it if they want. We don't <laughs> need to speak to it. That's what I it's not even an issue. Yeah. And the only reason I bring that up, Ted, is currently in our policies we have things in there with outside and inside. So yep. I'm just trying to break up from, what our, from what our current policy is, making sure that we are being clear as far as what we agreed to around the table. That, I think one of the things that we got to do is remove it from our current policy because our current policy sure. has that, right? Yeah. So, so this is kind of really creating the new policy. So many of those policies we can set aside and these become kind of our new pieces that we follow moving forward. Yeah. So Mark, what was your comment? So this, we're strictly speaking about summer school with, with what we're doing tonight, correct? Yes. What we're speaking to is summer school. Correct. So I don't want to, if we can talk further than that, I don't know why we need to leave it to summer school. I, I think that could be part of the discussion. I'd like to see it. You mean you're suggesting we make this motion for the next year? You're not going to see any data change from here to the summer. You could have spikes, but you're not going to see any change by the time we're going to have to make this decision come August. It won't change. Even if you have some spikes. I don't know that I, don't I know. even Five say months. that. Right. The medical committee, when we talked about it, we did set up a meeting for right before our August meeting so that the medical committee will be able to look at all that with the idea of we can have a in-depth discussion if anything did change, which hopefully the biggest change will be K6 vaccination. Right. Um, but I, I don't think we have to change that. But I think uh, one of the things when you look at this uh, daily uh, health check forms, get rid of those, uh, right. you know, uh, if we get rid of them, I'm not sure we're going to bring them back. Right. Yeah. right. And, so, that, and that's part of what's my so, point is some of the decisions you make tonight are kind of precursors to the So what's, what, those what's are, that, that's a good example. Uh, so I think what you got to do, you know, parents are making decisions now on where they're going to send their kids next year. Absolutely. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, we should still have the uh, medical ad hoc committee, you know, just to evaluate the data in August or in August. But I think uh, what, you know, to uh, Ted's point, I think we can make those decisions, and if we have to bring them back, we can bring them back. Well, I, I think so. it's just like all our other policies. We vote on this, and until we make a different policy, that's where you're at. Right. I mean, that's what we're looking at now. We have to change what we currently have in place to get to this. Yeah, this was kind of written as the talking points that, that we needed to discuss. Right. Can I recommend that we take these? piece by piece. Yeah, can we <laughs> chunk them? So we're not yeah. amending every, mm -hmm. some big long thing, so let's just piece it together. So that's what I would like to Thank do, you. is kind of chunk it together, and as we see it there, starting with the health forms down, giving Randy and, um, won't be Kurt anymore, but Randy and his staff, the flexibility to, you know, minimize the quarantine minimizing the contact tracing to the best of their ability to meet what we have to do with being county public health. Let's just look at that list first. So I make the uh, motion to uh, get rid of the uh, daily health uh, forms for students and staff. That probably is the bucket. Uh, I'll second that. Wait, don't you want to do tracing too? Well, I think the uh, tracing would be Let, Let's just, just those two. We're taking some. Okay. We're 
So are you saying for summer school and the school year? Yeah. Oh, and the school year? Yeah. Or it would just be the current policy. Yeah. It'll just become our current policy, and That's if we right. have to change it, we have to change it. That's right. So we're just looking at the health forms right now for staff and students, and there's been a motion to get rid of those, and it's been second. Any discussion on that? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we're done with that. Now let's move down to contact tracing and um, the possibility of quarantining. Mark? Yeah, I'd like to make a motion, both moving forward, including the school year, that we adopt these recommendations and would give the flexibility for uh, Randy and um, whoever's going to be replacing Fred to <coughs> work out the details to make it happen. I think just to clarify kind of what that means to us is there are some different things that we have to have with our relationship with public health as far as who's contact tracing. So some of that may mean we are doing more of it in order for us to have kind of the definition that, we're, that we can work with. Obviously public health is involved with some of the contact tracing too, so it's really kind of that. Our, our goal though is to minimize as much as possible on um, quarantine of kids. And the reason, for, I'll just add, the reason for that is <clears throat> because the students are in our schools and we have the contact information, the public health doesn't have access to that. So public health is going to be the tracers. They're going to need some information for them to be able to do it. That's, that's the key part of that. When we met with them or talked with them this afternoon, we actually talked to them twice today, the second time we talked to them, we had some further clarifying questions based on the information that they gave us, but they need to go back and talk to their tracing department about so that they can give us some clarifications. And we're, we're still waiting for that clarification piece. So are there some HIPAA issues because you will be sharing student information? No, well, there isn't. Um, um, the information we're giving to them is, isn't HIPAA information, okay. it's FERPA information. And FERPA information allows certain exceptions um, it, to, to share, that allow you to share without having parent permission. And public health and just basically other government entities for purposes of, in this case, mitigation measures related to pandemics is one of those exceptions that we can share all that she's going to information. So there's just a few nuances. It's that not a FERPA, right. or it's not a HIPAA, it's a FERPA. So if your direction is for us to continue to work through our process and with the goal of minimizing as much as possible the number of kids that we want to do. We don't want to do classrooms. So that was brought up specifically. We think we can get through without having to do classrooms and then minimizing other students. Yeah, it, it's no different than if we would have a meningitis outbreak or, or uh, you know, another communicable disease. That's how COVID is being treated now as a communicable disease, just like all of the other communicable diseases, uh, which one of the parents had shared that, yes, we have strep. Yes, we have, you know, we have outbreaks happening. Um, so it's not being treated like those. Pardon me? It's really not being treated like those. Um, I don't know about the, the contact for tracing the purpose that takes place. Of, for the purpose of providing information to public health, it's the same now. By who? So let's say that the school had to do that before? I mean, so if this were to happen outside of the school, how is, what is the process any different? Why is the school involved in doing the contact tracing at all? Why isn't it the individual that's like? If we had a student who developed a communicable disease, Public health would ask us for information similar to what they're doing for COVID so that they can manage, so that our community can manage any communicable disease outbreak. I guess so, uh, honestly, they'll walk me through it when strep happens. So, what happens in that case with schools? I mean, you're saying that's like any communicable. I, Really? I don't know that you contact not, not public things like strep, but when you no. get into the things like um, meningitis. meningitis. Well, meningitis. Uh, okay. 
it's a little bit different. That, that, that's, that's a little bit different. different. That's how it's getting treated more. It, it's a list of communicable. There's a list of communicable diseases. So, if you look at the uh, number of outbreaks or, or the cases, uh, do we need our contact tracers, or can we handle it through our yeah. nursing staff? And we we don't believe we do. Um, our, our nurses do not work during the summer. They're not under contract during the summer. They have 200 and 200 day contracts, so they do not work during the summer. But each building for summer has a um, an attendance slash um, health office assistant assigned to them, hired and assigned to them. Um, all of the individuals who've been hired for this summer have experience with the contact tracing process, with the exception of one. Uh, but that one is a, a building, works in the building in a different capacity during the school year, and has been trained by the health assistant in that building regarding our process. Yeah. We, think, we think the demand is going to be extremely low. Um, so, so the so question think is, we can do we need the uh, contact? So should this motion be to get rid of our contact tracers as right. well? We're going to need contact tracers. Some of them already are going to be working for us in the summer because they're working in our health rooms doing other things for, for summers. Yeah, it, uh, specifically answer your question, Jack, you do not need to take make a motion to eliminate the contact trace, the, the people that we hired specifically to contact trace. You don't need to make a motion to, because they were, they were employees that we only used when we needed to use them, and toward the end of the year, we really didn't So they're working in another capacity, them. but if we need so them, that's right. they know what they're doing. That's right. David. Um, I just want to be clear with one thing, I'm not trying to get into the other issue, but so if we adopt the close contact contract tracing as you have it written, right. and if we turned around and said K through six should be masked, they would never need to be quarantined. That's part of what, that, that's where I need to clarify. So some of the things that have shifted from our 330 conversation is with relation to these two pieces. And that's a piece that we're trying to work through. I mean, from a, from a perspective of public health in order, they're kind of leaning towards more of that level of determination of contact tracing. That's the seven to ten day piece. Um, there's also some language that and, and that we that we're working with with regards to if people are um, masked, do they have to then be quarantined? So that's the piece that Kurt and I feel like we have some latitude, kind of locally, for us to kind of figure out how we, in our process, can minimize the number of kids that we would quarantine. So that, that would be a risk as far as if you didn't have your child um, masked at school, they may get um, identified as at least potentially being a close contact. But you first of all, you're, the one piece that we don't know is what level of disease burden are you going to see in school? If it stays low, the number of kids that you're impacted is low. So in reference to that, had you made a motion? Yes. And was that seconded? No. The motion was to accept the plan listed, giving flexibility with Kurt and Randy to work out that final piece with public health and be going forward, not just for summer at the school, but on into the future unless we have no to Do our best to minimize the right. impact on Yes. Yeah, I'll second that. To, minim to minimize what, so you're, to this isn't contact impact. tracing, you're just saying give you the choice to do to what's necessary? To mit yeah, so whatever process we put in place to look for the options that help us minimize the number of kids for. Th there's some pieces, Ted, here, like as far as how we identify the kids that we, that we would have to turn over to public health. Right. So, so that's it's really just that, that we're identifying that. that process to figure right. out how can we, because like one option is an entire class. That's not what we're looking to do. So we're trying to work on what is our process and how would that look so that we can minimize that as much as possible. And that's some of the information that Kurt and I were working on at our 3.30 meeting today. But we, we have a few pieces we have got to finalize. Once we have that, we'll definitely share that out so people know what it is. Okay, 
Any other questions? So we're ready to look at just the contact tracing and close contacts. Um, all in favor of Mark's motion? Uh, aye. 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 Opposed? Perfect. Thank you. So moving up, we are now with the mask. I make the motion that we will not be updating and posting for the thing. I make the motion that we reduce, we we will not update or post the COVID-19 data. I second. Any discussion on that? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. So, can we do outdoor first? Concerns about outdoor policy there. Make a motion that outdoor face coverings will be optional for everyone. Second. I don't want it even stated. Can you make an amendment to the I'd like an amended then to say we don't say. Do we have a second? Yeah. Try and second okay. No, he, he second bond, yeah. So Correct. you want an amendment that we We don't even need to state that it's optional. It's not even it doesn't need to be stated. We don't need masks outside. You just want to state that anything regarding masks doesn't even mention outside, it's just silent. Absolutely. Outside. Doesn't that bring up a bunch of questions then? It doesn't because, because whoever, that would leave actually, our current policy in place. It doesn't do anything. If people want a mask, they can mask. But you do not have to state that it's optional because then you get people thinking that they need to. It doesn't need to be stated, period. Well, I think coming off a year of what we're coming off of, I mean, if, if people are going to ask, do I have to? That's what we're trying to eliminate right. is getting calls, do I have to? We're trying I agree, to, we're, not, we're not saying, we're saying. Well, is there a second for the order. amendment? You don't, you don't okay. Okay. It eliminates questions. So Ted had an amendment that he wants it completely eliminated from the language. Is there a second to his amendment? Second. So we're just going to not say anything. If no, the if that was that. accepted, we would not say anything, which would leave our current policy in place, which requires it. Yeah. All right. I'm going to vote against the amendment because what, it doesn't I'd like to be able to state, and it's, it's kind of to your point, but I just want to be able to state clearly because th there are questions that come to us with regards to what if this, what if that. I just want to be able to state that that there's no need for it outside. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically exactly what you're saying, Ted, but I know that there's questions that will come from, from people as far as, well, we're having this event, do we have to do this? We just want to say, you know. It's always optional. I suppose that people interpret masks are optional or masks are not required. I mean, there, there's, people look at that maybe a little differently. Sure. No, or you don't say anything I mean, because we're back to normal where I never thought about a mask. That's, I don't. The language to me there doesn't matter. I mean, I just think we're going to need to state it at some point because there are questions that arise around it. Now, I would argue a year from now, it won't be an issue. But coming off, as Dave said, a, a year of this, a year plus actually, um, I like to eliminate the needless phone calls because we stated clearly up front and repeat it in the fall if, if it's deemed necessary, um, just so that people get it's black and white. No, you don't have to. You don't have to. Win. So there is an amendment on the floor that we need to vote on, and the amendment is that the masking outdoor sentence is completely eliminated. Um, all is that correct? Being completely eliminated. It was, yeah. I get your point of yeah, making a yeah. statement that we have to say it. What I want to do is go back to, I, we don't even have to address it, but I would prove, I would rather it say masks are not required. There's my amendment. Not optional, they're just masks are not required. Are you going to second? Okay, so now the amendment is masks are not required. Uh, any discussion on that? So is that a different amendment? No, yes, just adjusted. Just the okay. the same. They adjusted. I don't know if he had to. Mm -hmm. Adjusted. Okay. Adjusted. Okay. Everybody got language. I, I think we all understand. Okay. Yeah, so the amendment is that instead of saying optional, we will say masks are not required. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? 
are. So now we're back to the original um, proposal, which would say masks are optional. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. One no. So, okay. Ten no. So just a second here. Um, so the masks are not required outside. Vote it down. Vote it down. Three. Okay, thank you. That's what I meant. Yeah, do you need the names? I don't know. Okay. Okay, so now we have two chunks, the K6 and the 712. Again, I'd like to take them separately. I'd like to make a motion for students going into grades 712. Face coverage shall be optional, and it will be up to the parents whether they want their children to wear a face covering to school. I second it. Okay. Um, any discussion on that? I guess I'd like to say before we vote, um, I agree with that. I don't think that masks need to be there anymore. I just want to be sure that if it's the parents' responsibility and it doesn't fall on the teachers, that the parents come and say, I want my student to wear a mask. The teachers can't patrol that. It's got to be patrolled by the parents. I think that that's a, an important message because teachers have to teach and they can't be, your parent wants you, they just can't do that. So that would be my um, uh, condition in that. Any other concerns or questions? All in favor of optional for 712, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. I'd like to uh, make the uh, motion that uh, A6 does not require masks. Master, I second it. Any questions on that or concerns? Mark? Coming in, I was really leaning considerably in the other direction. And I have really wrestled with this. Uh, I've got a grandson who we co parent that's gone into second grade, so I, I'm aware of what his experiences were. As a school board, we have an obligation to provide an education. And despite some of the communications we receive, that should be our only obligation. We also have an obligation to provide a, a safe place to learn. And so my question is, how do we respond to the parent whose kid receives uh, an infection small that is, it could happen. How do we tell them we're keeping your kids safe? How do we respond to the parent that has a kid that's messed up socially because these masks have been causing a problem, but we have no data on that to show that's the case. We can't. Well, and we do, but we do have data. No, they're pretty No, certain. I'm not talking about your point. We do have data that does suggest that the person wearing the face mask is best for the kid who's infected to be there. It's not necessarily a help to the kid who doesn't, but by requiring the mask on all, we keep the one infected from spreading disease. There's pretty significant data that supports that. Uh, I know there's data that says yes and no, but that's one I have not seen refuted. So, I haven't seen actually that data. I mean, they've said that, but I haven't seen that either. I mean, they can say that, but. I haven't seen that data. David? I have to say, since we formed the medical committee, when I was first looking at all this, I was leaning towards being like the vast majority of schools in Dane County and going 100% virtual. And the doctors on that committee unanimous, unanimously said, we should open K-4. They were not afraid. They were not saying shut the schools down. They were not saying the, the, the stuff that has been way too often accused of the medical community. They're divided now. And the reason, I, I think Dr. Potoff said it very well, the reason they're divided is because things have gotten better. It's almost good that they're a little more divided now and not so towards one end because it's showing things are getting better. And it's becoming a little bit more about how much risk 
versus how much you can gain. I gotta say, we're talking about summer school. These are optional classes, not mandatory. These are short-term classes. They're not even, they're hardly half a day long. I, I'm gonna vote with Dr. Potoff. I'm gonna sit there and say, you know what, for the short amount of time these kids have to wear a mask during the day, the risk just isn't, it, it just makes sense to say we're going to be safe, we're going to make sure every kid can stay in school the whole time, we won't have quarantining issues and stuff like that. And they're the only group that can't get vaccinated. So I don't see the downside of a two to three week class for three to four hours a day emotionally scarring these kids. But I do see one of them, a group of them getting quarantined, missing almost the entire class. Why would we run that risk? So let's do it the other way. And for the small time they have to wear that mask, they're able to be in the entire summer school. And that allows the most kids to get the most education instead of saying one lousy outbreak wipes out the entire class for almost the entire summer school. Thanks, David. Brian? Yeah, you know, I'm like Mark. I struggled with this all week. So. Um, but you got to make clear, I mean, it's every student's health is important. Yep. At all of, even, you know, 7 through 12, they can, we can still have people in there not vaccinated. And they bring in COVID, and we have to quarantine there, too. But, like Dave, I stuck with the data as well. And if you want, you can find data back in your point. <laughs> well, we've seen it for a year. You believe one way, you'll find the data. You believe another way, you'll find the data. But if we look at the low numbers we have right now, you know, we worried so much, and Dr. Random worried about our community and the older community. Well, in Dane County, 96% at least have one shot if they're over 65. 83% um, if they're over 35 have at least one shot. Um, it's less than eight cases per 100,000 in Dane County. It's less here, obviously. Um, you know, I, we have, I think we're ready to put it back on the families. And I worry about the finger pointing and, the, you know, your kid brought this into my school and now my kid's got to sit out. It's happened all year. It could happen again, but we'll let each family deal with that themselves. I agree. We need to have safe environments, but I think the numbers are low. The chance for outbreaks are low. Um, and it's hot, or it has been, but I, I, I think it's a chance for us to sort of also test the waters too. I hate to use that word because I want to use our students as testing, a testing ground to see how fall may go and, and stuff. But I think the numbers are low. People are out doing what they want to do right now. Um, I encourage people to keep getting vaccinated, and when the kids are ready, get them vaccinated. Um, I, I think it's a good thing. I think that's why we've seen such a big drop in our I mean, cases, and we'll continue to see it over the next couple of weeks. But you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna vote for family choice on on masks all the way through K through 12. But um, you know, we have to let tell the families if there's any symptoms, if they're sick, whether if you think it's the flu or COVID or allergy, they don't keep them home because we don't want to go through this problem. Judy. Oh, it was interesting when Dave was talking because I was listening to him and I thought I went the other way from what he said. The risk has gotten lower. I think it's a good time to see what's happened. It's a short period of time. It's a good testing time to find out what's going to happen when people have that choice. So I think um, I would have to go with this is a good opportunity to, to have masks being optional. So if I have a clarification. Um, the 712 that we voted on, is that for summer school and the school year or just summer school? Well, I think what all of this is going to be for uh, summer school and, and uh, school year. Well, the, the rest is. I don't know if that was specifically addressed or not. So, and well, for this recommendation, are you looking going forward? I'm, I'm looking going forward. Okay. Uh, you know, I, you know, when you look at all of this kind of stuff, uh, you're probably looking at going forward. Yeah. Because what I'm concerned about is if you get uh, people that aren't going to 
make different educational choices, that's going to affect their budget. Yep. So, you know, what we've heard is after every major spring break, starting sports, Christmas, we're going to see all these bumps, and we never did. And with the amount of people out in the community now, you can't go into a store, you know, without seeing people without masks, you know. And, you know, if, if this is, if we're going to get an outbreak, it should happen. And we continue. Um, let's can, just hear from a few are, more people and then maybe we'll be ready to vote. Ted, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, we, one of the individuals speaking made a great point in that we continue to talk, as did Pot, Dr. Potloff, about the vaccination rate, that it's 96 one. They never continue or never talk about the actual natural getting the actual COVID. It's a stronger immunization from that than the vaccine, and yet those numbers don't even enter into it. I think People have disagreement that that's. If we just went, I think we'd have a lot more deaths if we just went you herd immunity without immunization. But I'm. Yeah. Okay. I, yes. David, <laughs> one more comment. Yeah. Um, I just have two questions. One, Randy, if if a K six student comes up positive and they're the students in the class aren't vaccinated and are unmasked, would the quarantine shut that class down? But our hope is is that we would identify the kids that sit around them. Right. right. But, but, it would, it, but it would I'm not what, what what our hope is right now is that we don't have to shut down the whole class. Well, you, you never hope to shut right. down the class. No. I get well, that. Our, our practice this, our practice this past year has been as that class was operating and they're meeting in small groups, they were going outside for recess, they were doing those things, we did shut down the whole class because I couldn't discern who was a close contact or not in some of those places. That's why the yeah. elementaries had that. With summer school, it's a little bit different. And so we're looking at it as more or less looking at it how we did contact tracing at the middle school, high school, which was identifying the kids around them. So it's gonna be fewer kids but it's not going to eliminate that kids could get um, quarantined if they were. But any mean, kids that are close contact would be quarantined. It'd be seven to 14 days, depending on the number. How many, how many K-6 cases have we had in the last month or two? As we're saying, all the numbers are yeah, through the floor. Yeah, I think over the course, of, yeah, Kurt's got the whole the data pieces on there. I know it's a little hard to tell because, well, saying cases, it doesn't really say where they're Well, if, if you're talking positives, in the last six weeks, I actually did this today in my office. Yeah. I should have wrote it, should have written that down because yeah. I did it. Because Randy asked me um, in the last six weeks. We picked six weeks because summer school is six weeks long. So, it's actually going to be easier for me to do it on my computer. So as you're looking at that, I get a quick question. Uh, with summer school, with fewer kids, you can spread them up a little bit more. You do. You have classes. The biggest issue with summer school is like your class your number of kids in a class will vary greatly. So you might have 11 in one section, and you might have 23 in another section. So your ability to spread, yeah, absolutely. And people, what we are doing, um, seating charts, so that we know who sits where, mm -hmm. and so that we can at least track that, so we're not having to figure that out every day. So that's gonna be a piece that's kind of set. We also have to do contact tracing if you had to do that. You have to go back two days from when the student was deemed positive. So if you got tested positive on a Wednesday, you got to go back to the Monday. Mm -hmm. But if they're sitting in the same spot, they should be near the same kids. So it shouldn't be that big of a, a that's not going to exponentially change. Um, we're not going to contact trace things outside. So if, they, if a class goes outside or does something outside, I'm not contact tracing that. Right. It's mainly in the classroom. but. Our intent is not to close down the entire classroom. It is just to focus on those that truly would be considered close contact. Right. Randy, and it, so with the case of the summer student quarantine, quarantine, if it happens, yeah. there's not a plan in place to have them get the class remotely, is there? No. So they, they simply, if you go into quarantine, basically they'll 
Yeah, if you're in the builder it's class, that part of the class, the other ones, and you, yeah, yeah there's, so the first, there's yeah, this first session, you probably lose the first session. Yeah, I, you're you're going to lose part of it. I mean, it's and I think that, uh, I'm not, you know, opposed to that. I'm just, I think it's something the parents need to understand too, yeah. in terms of making decisions to or not to master kids. Yeah. Yeah. In, in part of what we're talking about, we spent a lot of time on quarantine, and, and Kurt and I talked a lot about this today. It's also looking at what what are your numbers going to be. Right. I mean, are, and that's that's the that's the unknown. I mean, as far as kind of what will that look like? I mean, our numbers right now for the last number of weeks have been low. No. And, and that was a piece of cool. I mean, for the entire year, K forward, we have 53 kids. Yeah. And then for the last six weeks, three, you three, if you add 56, it was 80. Yeah, so that was over the course of the entire course from September to the end of the, the end school of the year. year. So, so I do. Uh, at the last six weeks of school, K6, it was nine positive students. Out of how many hundreds is that? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess um, I would just like to share my thoughts. Um, summer school is optional. I have to agree more with Brian and with Judy. It's a short period of time. Um, and I also have to look at what Dr. Ranham said. Our adults that are at risk have had that opportunity to be vaccinated. We have very, very low rates in our whole community. And we and in our county, two, three cases a day in the whole county. So I am in favor of making it optional. But again, the comment I made about 712 really needs to be understood by um, the parents that parents have to police it because teachers have to teach. So with that, any other last comments or we're ready to vote on Jeff's motion? All in favor of optional for K6. Say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Thank you. Um, so we should also uh, go to uh, at the uh, board level. We should make a motion to get the word of uh, mask. And I, and I think that's the piece that we kind of look at adults. I think that's the next piece because that's, that's the other And part the teachers. I, I think so we should. As, as far as the, the teaching staff and, and as far as adults and as far as professional development and different things that we deal with, with in this building is, 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 is all adults. I think we need to make sure that we are we have direction for how to. So I think so. Should we handle that now or do it right I now? I think we well? need to say for our staff. I, I, I would make uh, masks optional, uh, you know, for, uh, for staff uh, in our building. Second. Any questions or concerns, David? What are our requirements for vaccination of anything? Do we have a requirement that staff has to be vaccinated against certain things? No. So, okay. That's fine. Any other comments? All in favor of optional masks for all the staff and adults in the district, say aye. 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 Opposed? Perfect. Thank you. So we can Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can Next chat. Okay, moving on to the budget committee. The budget committee, we have a lot of work. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Steve to uh, walk us through. Steve, can you hear us? Steve, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Jack, for uh, turning that over to me. Uh, I would like to cover the agenda items where the budget committee has a recommendation for the school board this evening. The first one is uh, this fiscal year 2020-2021 budget changes. Uh, once a year, we do bring 
a request to the school board to approve uh, the budget change process for the year. The Department of Public Instruction has a formal budget change document that is attached for your review. And in the board book notes, I wrote down uh, the changes that took place this year that resulted in the budget change document. Uh, the budget committee did review this information. <coughs> We just assume he's saying good things. <laughs> so one of the things we did is we reviewed this at the uh, budget committee and it uh, passed with uh, a 3-0 vote. And uh, tonight what we're looking for is a, uh, a vote to the full board to approve it. Thank you, Jack, for stepping up for Steve. <laughs> um, anybody have any concerns about that list? probably help fill in a few gaps. If not, I'm looking for a recommendation for um, these budget changes. I recommend that we accept these budget changes. Second. Um, did you get that, Rebecca? Um, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. So the next thing uh, we did was uh, looked at uh, uh, building uh, budgets and uh, department carryover funds. And what we re recommended is that we would pull 40% back from the, the uh, buildings. Yep, 40% was uh, returned. Well, returned to the Returned buildings. from the buildings to administration to uh, No, no. The buildings kept 40%, we've got 60%. No, 40% was returned. 40% 40 was, was returned. returned. We had the option of 40 or 50. Yeah. 40% yeah. right was returned to okay. the district. So uh, that passed. So we're, we're pulling back 40% uh, from uh, our buildings uh, for uh, district funds. So uh, that passed a uh, three, to, 3 to 0. Uh, and, and that is consistent with what we did last year because of, you know, things that weren't needed um, because of the yeah. attendance of students in school. So we would be looking for a motion on the carry over, carry over fund recommendation of 40%. I'll make that motion. Motion by Brian. Need a second? I'll second. Second by Ted. Um, any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. So then we went into uh, the second draft of, uh, of the uh, budget and uh, we looked at uh, some of our budget uh, planning documents uh, earlier in the year. I believe in the uh, first, uh, first draft we were looking at like uh, $150 per student increase and uh, we were uh, looking at uh, categorical aid for special ed of about 35%. Uh, and that was what Governor Evers uh, had uh, proposed. Uh, joint finance uh, basically came along and uh, zeroed out the uh, student increase. And uh, uh, basically, I believe what they did is uh, took it back to uh, last year's budget, right, Randy, for the, uh, I think so. for the uh, um, uh, special uh, Special education court uh, uh, category. Hey, Steve, I'm going to put you on my speaker phone on my phone because we have an internet issue here. Right. So, why don't you try that? Can, can everybody hear Steve if he talks through here? Uh, hello. Oh, yeah, Steve. Does that hello, work? Steve. So, right now we are on the second draft of the budget. Jack walked through the other items that were approved. So we're on consideration of the second draft of the 21-22 budget. Uh, the only thing I would want to make sure I had is that later on in the agenda tonight, uh, we're going to be discussing some legislative letters that Mark has drafted. And it's important to note that uh, there's a significant difference between the budget planning process that we've been working on and what was approved by the Joint Finance Committee. We did spend a quite a bit of time at the Budget Committee meeting 
going through that information with the committee members, and Mark has used uh, that information to help craft those letters that you see a little later this evening. And so just understand that the second draft is still based on the planning parameters that were approved by the Budget Committee earlier this spring, uh, and Mark will, re will be able to review that later on in the meeting with what those numbers look like between uh, what we were planning on, what the governor had proposed for the state budget, and then what the Joint Finance Committee propose, is proposing for the state budget. And so we'll get a chance to talk about that a little bit later, but that directly connects to our budget planning process. Uh, and I also want to note that the changes between the first draft of the budget and the second draft of the budget are highlighted in, in yellow for your review. And at the budget committee meeting, the committee did recommend approving uh, the second draft of the budget on a three to zero vote. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that might that any board members might have on this topic. So because we're in a uh, budget legislative uh, budget year, uh, this is gonna be volleyed back and forth uh, for a while. So to come up with, you know, our final version of the budget uh, is probably going to be a challenge. And what month is the final budget? Uh, the budget is, the state budget is supposed to uh, pass uh, end of June, because that's when their fiscal year starts. Uh, and we'll go to uh, our, our uh, levy in October. That's and deep. the reality is the governor could veto anything that's not enhanced. Right. So then we could be looking at August, September before they reach a consensus on where they're going to go. And right. Steve so, has already talked about not only the third draft, but the fourth draft of our budget, <laughs> so, because we so, don't know. Yeah, right. So I, you know, I think what we're, we're passing tonight is the best information that we have today. Right. Uh, and you know, stay tuned, it could change. Yeah. So we are looking for a motion for the second draft of the budget. Motion to accept the second draft. Second it. Yeah. I would like to make a comment that as we're going forward on these drafts, one issue that's going to come up on our referendum is getting our bond rating higher. Yes. And, I'm, and I, I wish Steve was in a better way. I understand he can't answer it now. It's too difficult. But as we go forward, I'm going to try and have a conversation with him about how can we move the money between the funds in this budget so that by next spring, during a possible referendum, we have a higher bond rating. Which yeah. will one one save of the us things we money. talked about at the uh, budget meeting, we've got a, uh, and, and, and the challenge is, is our, our bonding uh, or organization is saying that uh, because of our Fund 41, we're putting in uh, money into uh, Fund 41 for maintenance. Uh, it's it's not considered in their rating system. You know, it's kind of off to the side. So what we've talked about at the uh, budget uh, committee meeting is to, you know, basically almost get rid of Fund 41, but going to uh, policy and making a policy that we're putting money aside for maintenance on similar to what we're doing in Fund 41. And similar and to what we 10. do with technology. Yes. Because yeah, there's doing. referendum money that goes to technology, but we don't have a separate budget line item for that. That is done through policy and doing maintenance Correct. more through policy than we currently do. So what we're doing is uh, really trying to shore up our uh, bond rating uh, because we're moving this money back into uh, Fund 10, which really is the uh, fund that they look at for the health of your district. So we're, we're already talking about that from the uh, budget standpoint. Mark. I think you have a point of clarification where someone may be questioning that. Um, the tech fund is already allocated. It cannot be used for anything but that, and that's in fund 10. Well, we're looking at replicating that language the same way, that it's allocated strictly for maintenance, and it has a sub-number under fund 10. So it technically, it's, it will be a safe there as if it were in fund 41, but it, it should pick up our, our credit rating. Right. 
I appreciate you saying that, David, because that is an important consideration. So we have a motion on the table to accept the second draft of the budget. Any other concerns? Mm -hmm. all, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. The other thing that we, uh, we need a uh, vote on is uh, consideration of the uh, lease agreements. Uh, and this is with the uh, Wisconsin Youth Company uh, for uh, the school year and summer school. Uh, and then uh, new, new teachers uh, program. Uh, and then uh, first, first addendum. Actually, all of these leases are, uh, you know, come to us every year. Yeah, these are annual piece. They can, uh, you can take them as a lot. And you can see that we do an, an increase of an, an incremental increase every year. Make a motion to accept all four. I second that. Mark, did you have a question? No, just a comment. Um, the year of COVID, we did not increase the lease to the Wanakee Youth Company. We typically had $100 each year. So this year we did add that part to it. So this year they, the rates will go up $100 more and more. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Any other questions? All in favor of accepting all four leases, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So next we have administrative reports, starting with our pupil transportation handbook. Yep, Steve, if you're still there, can I, I know the pupil transportation handbook is the item up next. Yeah, is the, is the screen working in the boardroom? No, it is not. We've okay. lost our connectivity there. Okay, so uh, one thing I wanted to point out to the school board members is we've been looking at the new neighborhoods that are uh, under development in our community, and we've been looking at how those neighborhoods uh, would be impacted by our existing transportation policies. Uh, and I did put some information in the notes, and there was a map that you may have had a chance to look at before. Uh, the information that I wanted to share with board members about the Pupil Transportation Handbook is that the Arboretum Village subdivision is completely within one mile of Arboretum Elementary School. And so therefore, no transportation would be provided to the Arboretum Village subdivision to Arboretum Elementary. So I do expect that there's going to be questions from those who are building in that development. And I wanted to just clarify that uh, when mapped out, uh, that new subdivision is within walking distance to Arboretum Elementary. Uh, the second point is that the Heritage Hills subdivision the overwhelming majority of that subdivision is within 1.0 mile of Prairie Elementary School, except for the far southeast corner of the subdivision. So there's going to be a very small section, and that's going to be built out in, the, in future phases that will receive transportation to Prairie. But the homes that you see that are under construction right now and the overwhelming majority of the homes that are gonna be built in that subdivision are within walking distance, within 1.0 mile to Prairie. Uh, and one of, the, one of the most significant concerns we hear from parents every year as we start up the school year is whether or not their home is eligible for transportation. And so please keep in mind that the state law is 2.0 miles the, our local board policy is 1.0 miles, uh, but just please make sure you are aware of the fact that if you are contacted by community members building uh, homes in these new subdivisions, uh, that Arboretum Village is not eligible for transportation to Arboretum Elementary, and the majority of Heritage Hills will not be eligible to Prairie. And in the pupil transportation handbook, the only item that we changed was just to note that the Division Street uh, hazardous transportation area is basically uh, south of Main Street. So the area to the north of Main Street, which it goes all the way up to the water tower, 
uh, that is not included in the hazardous transportation area and would be within the walking distance of the Heritage Hill subdivision uh, to Prairie Elementary School. Uh, we did have a map that at some point you can get a chance to look at that really shows that small area of Heritage Hills that uh, will eventually receive transportation. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about uh, this agenda item. Steve, do you anticipate that um, we may need a crossing guard at a couple places on Arboretum Drive or that north side, or I guess it's north side of division? Right, that's a great question, Joe. Now, as an example, one would expect uh, in the Arboretum Village subdivision area, students will be walking down Hogan Road yeah. uh, and then approaching Arboretum Drive. And where those, where the crossing of Arboretum Drive is, is certainly a location that we may receive requests from parents for crossing guards. Our biggest challenge right now is we have not been able to fill all of the existing positions. Oh, uh, the okay. position that was located by the high school on Woodland and Simon Crestway, uh, once, the, once the traffic lights were available to us, uh, we were not able to staff that position for a period of time prior to the stoplights. And we have continuously uh, sought to fill and, and sought personnel to take these positions so we wouldn't be able to currently add crossing guard locations just strictly because of the fact that we don't have uh, a staffing level that would support it we are continuing to seek out crossing guards uh, it's certainly something that we would like to you know, improve our number of you know folks available for that position uh, but even if we wanted to right now to add a crossing guard position we don't have any available individuals to do it. All right, thank you. So we are looking um, at a motion to approve the transportation handbook. Make a motion to approve the uh, transportation handbook as presented. Second. Any other questions for Steve or thoughts? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, consideration for Dane County Drivers Ed Scholarship Program, which we have done in the past. Any comments, Randy? Yeah, this, this is something we've done the last few years. It's something that's provided by Dane County for um, economically disadvantaged students. It's been a, a, a good program across the county, and it's benefited some of our students. So I ask for your approval of that tonight. Make the motion to approve the uh, uh, Dane County Driver Education Scholarship Program as presented. Second. Any comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Four edition special ed. You're going out in a bang here, Kurt. <laughs> Come on. I just thought you were a good guy. <laughs> I am a good guy. <laughs> People just want to move here. Okay. What do you need? Because you Built all these new, you let all these subdivisions start out. <laughs> Build them and they will come, right? Isn't that right? Um, I, any questions? I think I laid it out pretty. Yeah. I think I laid it out pretty clearly in the um, in the memo. I, I did foreshadow because mm -hmm. it seems like each day, and Joyce Endress, my administrative assistant, and I talked about this today because we've had some additional move-in notification of people moving in. So. I kind of foreshadowed that what I requested ultimately may not be enough, but I didn't want to put any more than what I felt was needed at the moment that I needed to submit this tonight. And I make the uh, motion to for the uh, four additional special education para educators. Second. Okay. You can. Have you can. I've, nope. had I've had enough. Brian. <laughs> yeah. Um. Any questions for Kurt or discussion on those? positions. All in favor say aye. 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 I think this is it for me. <laughs> that was your last I, I, do want, I do want to thank the boards, the current board as well as the boards that go all the way back to our Townley, um, Bernie. Bernie Kennedy, That's Maureen nice. Van Dinter. Thank you for all the support that you've given me over my 24 years here. Thank you.
I think we should have a motion to have a board meeting every week until he retires. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, moving along, consideration for facility used by outside groups. Yep, um, this is a piece that I, I, this will be the last time I hopefully have to bring this here. I'm just looking to really open our schools back up to the outside groups and per normal operations, they would go through Aaron and the, act, and the um, athletic activities office to schedule those, but we don't have, I would like to remove all of the restrictions. So move. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, follow up from our board meeting on facility planning, looking at those timetables again. I just I put this item on here. I mean, last week I appreciate the, the board's time as we went through a number of things just to bring everybody up to speed on facility planning. I uh, wanted to put this on here for an opportunity for the board to um, share any of their perspective as they uh, walked away from that meeting and have had time to reflect on it. Specifically from an administrative viewpoint, one of the things that we do need, I would like at least your, your feedback on is, this is certainly not a commitment to going to referendum, but it's definitely timelines that if you had an interest, for example, in an April 22 um, referendum question, there's definitely timelines that we would have to adhere to and that would require us to be doing some things this summer. Um, a timeline in um, November of 22 um, would give us some um, additional time so that some of the things that we are, are working on could uh, really take place once we have our enrollment pieces in the fall. So this really agenda item is just to kind of give you an opportunity to share anything that you have or questions that you would like us to bring back um, regarding our last meeting. But I would like some feedback as far as um, if there is a timeline piece that you want to have in mind, it's not a commitment to a referendum, it just starts to lay out some of the work that we would have to do in preparation for that consideration. David. Do you want this in a motion or do you just want to have an idea? I just think we need, an, I, I think we need to have a general consensus around the table if that can be achieved. I don't need a motion, otherwise it would. But I think if, if you're looking at April, there's definitely things that we have to consider. It, it can't be drastic changes to the plans we already have in place. It has to stay within kind of that, that streamline. And we would have to then be putting pieces together this summer in order to kind of preempt some of the work for the fall. I, I would suggest that we go with the goal of April. And if we're not ready, we can back off to November. But the thing that gets me the most about this is it's going to be five years before we, if we approve a referendum it's going to be five years from then before we have a new middle school and every single year we are paying for another building outside now it's going to cost us hundred and eighty thousand dollars on our as a budget line item every year from now until whenever we finish that school and i i don't <laughs> construction costs never go down so the sooner you start the process, the better. I, I just think we're, we're delaying the inevitable. Try to go for the earliest date we can so that we can finish five years from now. I just want to make sure we have a realistic date that we're not moving faster than we can really move. And if delaying is six months to November 2022, I don't see that as a, uh, a negative at all. I, I, I really would like to make sure we have the time to do it the way we want to do it. Um, so I would prefer the November 22. I would, I would uh, second that, uh, you know, because I think what that does is gives us an opportunity to uh, get our September count uh, to really understand where we're at. Uh, I know there's a bubble going through on the uh, middle school. Uh, We've uh, accomplished taking care of that, uh, and it also gives us an opportunity to look at the uh, uh, K uh, four, you know, the, the uh, class levels. Randy, when we had our discussion after last meeting, you felt we could do November, we could do April 2022, and, uh, since we're pretty much down to three. Yeah, I've had a conversation with our with our EUA team just with regards to 
um, real, I mean, April's tight. I mean, what it would require, and I, Andy's here, he and I have kind of talked through this, and Robin's here as well. I mean, there are, it, it really limits you. There's not a lot of changes you can take, and we have to start narrowing down and figure out how do we go from six options down to two, two or three, so that we can then be ready with testing those and moving those into engagement pieces with the community in the fall. So that, that's the piece that's going to require us to do some of that work this summer in order to hit those targets is those surveys that we normally do with the community, they take a bit to put together. We've started one pre-COVID, it would be a matter of continuing with that, but we'd want that to be hitting the streets probably in September, I think is what we were targeting, Andy, if I recall. From yeah, so that's, that's the real heavy lift here, and so, um, everyone. So doing that engagement uh, piece, uh, we definitely want to do survey. Typically that uh, survey, when you're targeting a, a spring referendum, that window opens up sometime in the fall, typically in October. Um, when you're doing a survey, you want to narrow down those options, usually doing some sort of community engagement work in advance of that, um, in advance of that uh, survey. So you're engaging the community in, in advance. That would happen sometime over the, the summer. There aren't a whole lot of opportunities to, uh, to do that. Uh, we can do that, of course. Um, but we would have to do uh, a fair amount of uh, advanced work um, in June um, and, and July in order to, uh, to prep for that. Um, a heavy lift, uh, but certainly something that we couldn't do. I, I am more in the line of Jack and Mark. I think that November is um, more reasonable, and I think it's just really important that we get back to starting school normal, we look at that population, we look at, we give our administrators some summer time to have some time off. They were almost every day last summer trying to deal with COVID and I just, I really need a break and I would much, I am so much more comfortable with November 20. I think the uh, the other thing you've got is uh, building materials are through the roof, uh, and it put, potentially, you know, gives us an opportunity to get away from the uh, COVID uh, challenges. You know, you had mills that were shut down. You had, uh, you know, they're, they're filling the pipeline. Well, another consideration I think is just our community. And our community. I mean, we've all been heavy, heavy lifting here. But they still have they, and it might be good to give them a break from a huge decision, unfortunately a, a, a huge price, and to give them a little breathing room. And, and we we come to them, you know, for, uh, you know, to reach that November twenty second date. They're going to know we know more. I, I, that's the biggest thing I feel like is that we need to know what we need to know and, and without rushing 100 miles an hour to get there i'm not sure that makes sense to our community so much more important to do it well than to do it fast well i think some of the work has already been done last year and we're narrowed some things down yeah. we're already ahead if we were going to push it through i i think that i think this the administration and the staff want new buildings and i don't know if waiting pushing it off is, you know, if we can get it done in April, I mean, if the administration says, and these guys say that, you know, yeah, it's a tough call, but we can do it. I, I have no problem with April of 2022. And yeah, we have to start some community engagement. We talked about doing every other month, doing a community engagement. We've got the Performing Arts Center. We can, we can start with the present, presentation that we have right now and start that community engagement, you know, to let people know what's going on. But, you know, if April 2022 20, comes up, I mean, I, I would vote for that, but... No, November 22 is what we're talking about. Well, I know, but I'm talking to Dave's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I would like to do it sooner than later, but... Um, 
Brian, I think that's a fair point. Um, we don't want to imply in any way that April of 22 is, is off of the table. Vogel, I think, is comfortable with, with that. EUA is certainly comfortable with that uh, timeline. One thing that we would say is that and I don't want to use the word uh, limitation. Uh, one of the considerations that you should keep in your kind of collective minds is that if April of 22 is a consideration, then um, I think uh, you would uh, be limited. I will use that, that, that term to the options that were on the table in 1920 uh, when you were doing that initial set of, of planning. You wouldn't um, have the time to consider a brand new site, for example, um, or a brand new option. There just isn't the time to do the technical work, the, the technical exp exploration um, uh, for a, a, a brand new option. Yeah, where we left off last. Thank you. Where we left off in February of 2020 was we had narrowed, we had identified what projects we were interested in. The next step, we were going to do a community workshop that was going to be presenting those to the community. That was an in-person type thing where they could come in, ask questions, our team would be there, and to get feedback as far as, well, what are your thoughts on these different options to try to get some perspective. And then that piece was then going to be informing us as we went into narrowing those scopes down to then start to write that survey and put more detail to it. So that was kind of where we left off yeah. last time. So if you're not adding more options to the table, that's still, I guess, I see where we're at. The difference is, is that Jay's gonna have to cost those again. And, and that's gonna be, that, that's one of the pieces of all those different aspects would have to get costed. But that's where we jump off. The piece that we don't have is the enrollment projections to get kind of the, the solid numbers to be able to talk um, at very specifics about those, but that would obviously come once we hit September. Yeah. And, and I would add one little caveat to that. If it's a small little tweak, so for example, we talked about an 800 student middle school at the intermediate site last planning cycle. If it's a 750 student tweak, you know, um, or a 700 student uh, option. That sort of change is is definitely doable, right? But if it's, you know, some sort of alternative site at newly acquired land somewhere else in the district that would require, you know, a wetland delineation study and soil borings and all sorts of stuff. That sort I don't of, see any of yeah. that, Andy. Yeah. I think yeah. what we have is what we have. Exactly. And that's kind of what we talked about. So. It's, it's kind of not just a question as far as what's that timing that the board feels is. I mean, I, I agree. We can hit April. Yep. It, it gets our, it, it, it's going to put us in motion for those things. We're going to have to have some things here at the July meeting where we start to lay out how we're doing that engagement to narrow those down to be able to hit September, yep. October with the survey. That's, exactly. really, that's I, really what it means. I would make a motion to move this out to November 2022. We're not motioning anything. We were just going to come to consensus, and we have a few more comments. Uh, we're two years behind from when we were supposed to be doing this. <laughs> We've been planning this for over two years. To sit there and say we're suddenly going to look at a new site, uh, that's not going to happen. We know what the six options are on the table. We were practically down to two, two years ago. I don't think we're suddenly going to expand beyond that. And you know what? If we hear from the public in September, and we start shifting around, great. We heard from in September, we can start to shift around. If we say we're gonna take the summer off and we're gonna take the first start of the school year off, we gave up all the extra time we were looking at for November anyway. That's only five months away. You're sitting there going, you're gonna give up three months of the summer. You, you didn't gain any real time. You just started the whole process four months later and ended up with almost the same time window. I, I think we let the community engagement piece happen if we see some issues, it's not hard to move from April to November. And we do it at that point. But we don't hamstring ourselves now. Mark. Pardon me. I'm going to put you on the spot. What date do you prefer? 
Um, you know, I, I think it's fair for us to hear from your perspective. Uh, I know you'd go with any of the dates we pick, but in, in terms of looking at what's got to happen outside of the referendum potential and then the referendum itself, do you have a preferred date of the three? The only piece, though, I mean, as it starts kind of going through and start talking to the community, uh, the, the number one question we get community-wise is going to be need. Mm -hmm. Why do you need it? I mean, it's particularly if you're going out and you're showing all these options, they're going to want to know what's on. Uh, and uh, that's the one data piece we've got to figure out, regardless of where we go with it. We're not going to have a solid idea of what enrollment looks like in the fall. We're just hit that strange time with the pandemic, etc. We don't have that. I, I, I really want that as part of the conversation with the community. So as we go out and start narrowing things down, and that is a legitimate question we will get, which we have a partial answer to, a projected answer to, but I don't have a real answer to. That's my only concern with April, is as we start narrowing these pieces down, I'm not going to be able to give that specific answer. So from that respect, that's why I've had in my mind November. But it, 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 but it's, but it goes back. We can't hit these markets because I, sure. I mean, that was a conversation that Andy and I had this week. Was where we left off was jumping in to the narrowing process. As long as we're not looking at other options, we're back at the narrowing process. With Jay having to spend some time to really update his numbers. So it's, it to me, it's really. How important is that enrollment data to our initial conversations? If that's a very important driver for those narrowing conversations, then I think you have to go to November. If you can have those conversations and you feel we can do that, um, we're going to have the numbers this fall, which will lead into when we get into more specific communication, because that's a big part of the back end. The whole last three months of a referendum are talking to the community. So we'll have all those. But how important are those on the front end? If that's an important driver, as we're having this dialogue, then I think we're not going to have that till September. That's that's the only reason that I have my concern with April is how important is that for our initial dialogue? I think I think it's important. Mm -hmm. I think you need an understanding of, of, of that. David, I think we had that answer though, in a way. When Mark was here and we were talking about the middle school and having to buy that additional building behind us, it was, we are currently at 616. And Mark said, even with that bubble going down and getting past the 690, we're not going below 650 again. That's too many students for the size of the building now. That additional building we're putting behind that middle school is never going away. That's your answer. How many additional buildings do you want in a parking lot to teach students? Mm -hmm. We're already up to four classrooms, and that's this year. And we're five years away from getting a building. I, I just don't see how that ever goes away, and that's the answer to the question. You can't get rid of mobile buildings at the middle school ever again. So I respectfully request, what do you want? You know. We can have this uh, argument for the next 45 minutes, whether we're going to have it in April or November. Do you want a motion on this? Or it doesn't seem like we're going to get to a consensus. OK, let's uh, take a you know. Can I just ask one question? Do you feel that that enrollment number that we got from Mark Rawford is sufficient? Or do you think that for our public engagement, we should we need the September count. For the initial work that we're doing, I guess, Andy, because we know we need it later on, but for the initial work, how important is that in, in finalizing our, kind of our pieces? So, uh, I mean, I think that that tells part of your story in, in Wanakee, right? So back in 2014, you had a really compelling growth story and a, a really compelling capital maintenance story uh, at, at Heritage. I think, you know, kind of hearkening back to the presentation that you saw a, a week or two ago, um, you saw kind of like four buckets of, of need, right? It was modernizing your learning environments, your long-term growth, 
you know, looking longer term at, at the high school and then capital maintenance, right? So those were kind of your four buckets of, of need. If you um, kind of focus on those and elevate that, um, you know, educational adequacy component, yes. um, I think that that's getting at the, the story that, that Dave is, is talking about. Um, if you, you talk a little bit more about um, the, that uh, component, that aspect of, of your, your story, and, and that, that decreases the need to talk about the, the, the growth and decreases the need to, to... So you could advertise it differently. Exactly. You're selling, you're selling that, that, that story, um, that, that, that need, um, that growth need. Um, well, I think more people are want to pay for a better educational environment. Yes. I, I don't care about 10 extra kids or 20 extra kids. I want to update our schools so we continue to be a top-rated school in this area because we need to be able to have the environment to teach and the resources. And, and, and that's the story that I feel like we should, you know. Well, I think at the, at the same should. time, and I, I think at the same time, folks are seeing environments like you see at the intermediate school being built in Verona and Middleton and Sun Prairie and and elsewhere, and you know, kind of making that comparison. Are you seeing you know those environments you know elsewhere in the district here? Um, you know, and that's a valid point, Brian. I mean, when you take a look at like. I mean, obviously, heritage has a has a driver of enrollment, but if if the other driver is is that many parts of that building are really coming to end of serviceable and maintenance life, is there a point where you replace it regardless of enrollment? And and and, and, and so what you're bringing up from an instructional standpoint, it it makes less of the need for the the numbers, but you're going to get the numbers eventually right. it's really yeah. just i just need to know kind of where you want to go as yeah. far as are we diving deep we have we have a meeting tomorrow to kind of yeah. talk post this meeting it's, and what we'll do is we'll lay out what our agenda is and what we have to accomplish yeah. and so i just need some direction from the board as far as where your interest is april or november or after yeah can we maybe just do a show of hands of people interested in april and then people interested in november because it seems like those are our two options and would that give you that's all a good I enough? it's the same as the board i just need direction okay so i guess let's just do a show of hands of people who are interested in the april 2022 timetable three people interested in the november 2022 timetable. all right so we'll build it off of that and what we'll do is once we have that, I'll bring that back at our at our next meeting, so you can see exactly kind of what that timetable looks like, and we'll build that out. Um, very good. Thank you. Um, moving on to National Equity Project Membership Renewal. I'm going to ask Tim to step up um, for this one. He has been working in this area. This is actually the second year this has come forward to the board. Um, um, as you know, we were identified as disproportionate. Um, with some of our students and as a result we've had to reallocate some of our CEIS money and this is really where those dollars are coming from and Tim has worked very closely with National Equity Project and some of the value that it brings to us. Yeah, so just a little bit of the backstory on our engagement with the National Equity Project. Two years ago CESA II um, worked with the districts within the CESA and with the National Equity Project to facilitate some initial leadership trainings uh, and we had some of our teacher leaders and uh, a segment of our administrative team participate in that. Uh, subsequently, we had the opportunity, which we entered into for the year we're just completing, for the first year of the network. Uh, and that uh, provided for a few different things. We had a set of professional development sessions over the course of the year uh, with the leadership team as part of a network uh, that involved I think we had nine schools in our network. I'd have to go back and check. Uh, mostly in the upper Midwest, uh, in Wisconsin, it was us, Burlington, and DeForest. Um, we did have one district from California in our group, but otherwise the upper Midwest. Uh, and we also had opportunities for some of our students from our high school affinity groups to participate. 
uh, and their area will serve as focus groups for us and identify some issues from their perspectives. Uh, this would extend this uh, for the next two years. It is a little different in the sense that the network that they ran this year was really their initial response is so many things were in so many sectors this year to kind of the unique circumstances of dealing with the pandemic. Um, everything was virtual. Everything would be virtual at least for 21, 22 uh, in this new proposal. But there's a lot more structure uh, in terms of data, iterative processes, things like that, uh, and, and formal capacity development uh, in this upcoming two-year commitment. And uh, you know, our thinking is uh, this will help us uh, set up more of a structured set of processes within the district uh, to complement the work of the ad hoc committee and also to set more of a, uh, a, a true plan for addressing these disparities we're seeing that have led to this uh, federal accountability piece in special education, get some measurables, track our progress, uh, and begin to really demonstrate some progress. Any questions? Make the motion to approve. Second. Um, any questions or comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, announcements and correspondence? Yeah. A couple of fun announcements. Obviously, our forensics team is continuing to I mean, even through the year and being virtual, they were receiving mm -hmm. another one of their Excellence in Speech Awards. So congratulations to Walter Stenz and the team um, for those efforts. And then Aaron Schroeder, Schrader, Schrader. Schrader. I'm from Monroe, it's a Schroeder. So, <laughs> I, every time I read it, looking like that. Um, she's received a huge award for um, her work as a, as a math instructor in our, in our state and is on to a national competition that recognizes her for her efforts. So. Um, we really wish Erin well. She's been a, a great leader and a great instructor for us. Thank you. Really a great honor. Um, this consent agendas, I would just like to recognize a couple things within the consent agendas. First, the Terry and Deanna Schattenberg and Sons donation. Such a generous cash donation to our school district. I want to um, recognize that and draw some attention to that. Deanna Schattenberg was a current teacher, a previous teacher, not current, previous teacher at Prairie um, Elementary for many, many years, left our district a couple years ago. So, uh, wonderful donation. And, um, did you wanna mention the thank yous at this time or later? Yeah, we could. Um, no, through the years, we received various levels of donations. I'm not sure we've seen one quite like this uh, or this kind of a target, but it seems as a board, we're grateful for it, we hear it at the meetings, but ought we not send a thank you directly from the board, uh, whether it's this or $500 for camp, uh, to have it read right at a meeting, I think, about, okay. Actually, we do. As soon as you guys talk about this, I send a letter from the board to Oh, perfect. Board. Okay. Oh, thank you, I had no idea. Thank you. We were going to <laughs> assign somebody to do that, but thank you. Yeah, we did that with all the donations. Oh, perfect. perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so that's all I really have to comment on the consent agenda so we could just want to add make sure that we have um, Rick Franz is articulated on our our HR update as our director of technology just okay. make sure that that's included in and on part of the um, recommendation okay so uh, we could take the whole list or if anybody wants to pull something out they could motion to approve what's presented I second and that will include the Rick Franz hiring okay. as well um, any other questions on the consent agenda? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Um, and then we have board business. So I just again want to thank Mark for his time in 
drafting these letters. I hope that all of you had an opportunity to read them. We drafted a letter to um, Evers, the Joint Finance Committee, as well as to the Tribune, outlining what would specifically happen to Wanakee with the current budget proposals at the state level. And um, I guess if you have any concerns or questions, or Mark, you want to comment? Yeah, I, I got these numbers uh, in concert with Steve, and I had them review the letter for accuracy, of, of, particularly with the data. And uh, it, it is, is it, he supports what I've written here. Uh, the big number being uh, approximately 48,000 in total increase compared to 1.2 million from a year ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just the way the numbers fall with the way they've done their budget. Steve, are you still there? So what's the plan? Uh, we sign this uh, as yes, the board? Yes, Randy, I am. Right. Yeah, we sign it as the board. And, uh, um, I would think the easiest for joint finance would be to send it by email to each of the members. Or we can send us a letter. Uh, I, I think email. the email works yeah, really I, effectively. I um, same thing with the governor and then uh, with the Tribune, we submitted to the Tribune. Thank you. Yeah, do you have anything to add, Steve? I know you worked with Mark on some of the specifics. Yeah, I just want to add, just as a reminder, the, the numbers are estimates based on what we anticipate our student count will be in the fall and taking a look at all of the variables that the Budget Committee has previously reviewed. Uh, using the uh, enrollment from the fall, just like we typically do in budget planning. So it's the best numbers that we can use as of this time, uh, according to our budget planning model and working with uh, Forecast 5. But the numbers are uh, the best that we can do at this point for estimating. Uh, and I, I want to just thank Mark for taking the time to, uh, to put these together because it's an important message that uh, districts under the Joint Finance Committee proposal are not receiving an increase in funding for operational expenses, expenses like salaries, benefits, transportation, utilities. Uh, those are expenses that could not be covered under federal uh, COVID funds. And so it's an important point, you know, important point to make that uh, those operational expenditures for school districts are typically covered by increases in state funding, and Mark's letters uh, certainly make that point clear. So, um, you'll follow up with Rebecca, or you'll jump forward. Yeah, we can and work with you, Mark, to get that out. That. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you again for doing that, Mark. I appreciate it. Um, future agendas and meetings. Okay, well, future meetings, I'm going to start off with the, the three that I need are budget, HR, and facilities. Um, I think, Steve, as you're looking at the 7th or 8th for a budget, is that correct? Yeah, or the 12th before the July board meeting, if that works for people as well. Yep. So either the 7th or the 8th for a budget meeting. Okay. Either day works for me. So budget, Jack, Mark, and Joan. That's uh, July. Yep, of July. So if we look oh. at the seventh. Seven is good with me. Sure. What? Yeah, seven. Is there, is there a good time? I can do any time now. Jack, what's best for you? Uh, five thirty. Okay. Okay. That works. So that's. Budget. Okay. We also need an yes. HR committee. And I know, Brian, you're traveling that week, is that right? Yeah, yeah it would work best. Uh, I would be Zoom attending, but it would work best if we could uh, get something on the 6th or 7th. If we did it on the 7th, if, if we did it, so HR is Judy, Joan, and Brian? Yes, I can could, I could make anything work during that, during that day, okay. whatever works for the committee. Would a, like a 4.30 work before the budget meeting? On the seventh? Sure. Yep, sure. So if we did four thirty 
in HR. And then we'd also like to look at a facilities meeting. Um, that's Dave, Jack, and Ted. Um, I think we want that at any time um, before the 12th. So. Could do all three of them on the same we day. We could do them on the same day if you want. We could just, how long do you need for budget, Steve? I would say an hour. So if we did 6.30? No. It, does that work? So the facilities would be Dave, Jack, and Ted. Would 6.30 on the seventh work and just back them all up? Work. Work for you, Ted? Get them out of the way. We've got them all lined up on the 7th, so we've got budget at 5, HR at 4.30, followed by budget at 5.30, and facilities at 6.30. <laughs> the other one that could occur between now and the board meeting, um, there's a few things that I'm working on, is the goals committee um, maybe finding a time to get together, but I don't have a time set when that's going to fit yet. So that'll either be before the 12th or probably immediately after, so somewhere in there. Um, since we're talking about agendas, though, on the next monthly meeting, I'd like to bring information on the Wisconsin Public Education Network. That's the group that's setting up this rally we were talking about. Um, they're a statewide group. They basically advocate for public education. Um, obviously, their stuff is on vouchers, the state budget, and all this. But there are multiple school boards that belong to them. Um, and the reason they're a little bit separate from the school board association is because they're more political advocacy. Um, but I think it's something that would help us get our political stuff. We always talk about doing it. It's hard to build it. They kind of build it for you. Um, so I'd like to bring information next meeting about that right. with the idea that you guys could then start considering, do we want to be as involved Basically, Sun Prairie pretty much uses them as their evidence. Yeah. I'll just put it under the board report for the next for the July meeting. John, to go back over a previous agenda, just the mention of the rally on the 21st. Uh, would you like anyone who's interested to contact you? So you Actually, know, I, I know you'll be gone. When so. I opened my phone, Steve had reached out to me and said, Is there anybody who is going to attend? He has. He would just like a number. Yeah. Of people who might attend. I think I would. You might attend. Is there anybody else that might go down on the 21st? All right, thank yeah, you. I'll be there. I will, I will let him know that at least. And Tim, isn't there a, 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 a Ho Chunk um, yes, conference so or something coming up? That is going to be the afternoon of the 23rd. And you received an email on that from me a few weeks ago. Yep. I will, I'll send out a reminder. Uh, sure. And it's going to be recorded. So if your schedules don't allow for the afternoon of the 23rd, uh, we're going to record the Zoom session and you can get it. And, uh, Thank you. Awesome. All right. So, motion, motion, to <laughs> motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Steve. Have a good rest of your birthday. <laughs>